can get everything in focus. And uh, the third thing uh, that's controlled by all our cameras these days is the shutter speed. So you have the film speed, the shutter speed, and the f-stop. So I always have my camera when I'm taking my pictures on a uh, f-14 or f-16 so that I can get more of what I'm doing in focus. So that's it in a nutshell. And I, don't, I couldn't explain a lot more than that because I just do it now by rote. Uh, Taylor Dabney is a guy that takes uh, professional photographs of craftspeople's work. And because I had dark rooms back in the 90s, he came to my house and really helped me figure out how to take uh, shots of the work that I was doing. All right, next. And the kind of work that I do with multi-axis work, I really like to control the light because I use light woods so that you can see the shadows as well, and I think that's part of the beauty of the lighting that I choose to light my work. Next. Mm. As you can tell, I cleaned my shop up just for this. <laughs> so uh, this is the setup that I use. You can't see my pointer, so I will talk about it. I have a gradient backdrop that I got, and it's made out of vinyl, and I've used it for years. I think this is my second one. Uh, so that I no longer have to control the shadow in the back uh, with a light here and then a screen here to make it darker at top. So that's the gradient. You can't, well, so to the left, then you can see my camera, which I'll have a better shot of, and that's back uh, there. That's right. And then you can't see the, the light I use. I only use one light, and that's a digital light, and it's to the left of that camera, but you'll see that in another shot. Next. I use a telephoto lens and I have my camera way back and I'm able to then zoom in on the object. And the reason I do that is for the parallax, that when you use a, a closer lens, sometimes there's a little distortion. And so a telephoto lens all the way back gives you less distortion. So mm -hmm. that's my tripod and, that's, uh, and I have it set back so I can use that telephoto lens. And uh, next. And now you can see the light. I have one digital light that I have. And uh, yeah, thank you, you're highlighting that. And I turn all the other lights off in my shop. And I like, um, this isn't a multi-axis piece, but you know, I really like to see the shadow. I think it gives it more of a depth. So my goal photographing my work is not to have everything lit on all sides so you see no shadows. I really like uh, photographs like this. Uh, okay, next. And that's just a close-up of that, um, that turned oak piece that I, oh, that's pine. My, I had pine trees fall down in the ice storm, so I thought I'd turn a piece of pine. And then I torched it and uh, brushed it, and I really liked the grain. But um, I think photography is, there's some shots that, or ways to, to photograph our work that people like if you're going to submit it to shows. Uh, but I really do like the depth that you get with the shadow in there. Next. And then here are two candle uh, holders that I've just turned out of maple. And it shows how the lighting's coming from the left. The shadow shoots off from the right. And you can see um, some of the, the shadows on the work. But um, what else? I was going to say one other thing. I can't remember. But I love digital photography because now I don't have to take all my film downtown and bracket it and all of that. Uh, sometimes when I'm not sure about a piece, I'll photograph it, bring it into my computer and, and have a look at it on my screen so I can actually see things a little clearer. Barbara, this is Ron Bishop. Yeah, hi, when, Ron. When, when you're using your telephoto lens, do you use your camera on autofocus or do you focus it? I have it on autofocus unless I have a hard time with it, but my autofocus, I have to put the dot right on the work. And then if that's not centering the work, then I will then move the camera a little. And uh, I, then I have it on a timer as well, because with a small aperture, uh, F16, uh, the, it's small, so it takes longer for light to get in. So you're going to 
be more than a second maybe to, to expose that. So I use a timer for that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Bar Barbara, this is Steve. Um, what kind of ISO setting do you use with these? Because it seems like on some cameras you can set it so high that you wouldn't have a, a big time required for the, uh, the shutter speed anyway. I put it on, uh, I have my camera set for the f-stop and I let the camera adapt for all the other two things. Okay. So I don't control for ISO. I do control then for shutter speed or exposure. Uh, if I want it a little darker or a little lighter, I'll keep the f-stop where I want it. And then I can control the shutter speed. Uh, but um, no, I don't, I'm sorry. I, I, there is a, if you go back to the camera uh, image, you can control the ISO. Right. Or the, exactly what you were saying. You can control that, but I only control that right there, the uh, ISO, the little numbers right there, I can make that right in the center or I can make it darker or lighter depending on what, what I'm seeing the photo looks like. But I always leave the f-stop on f14 or 16 and okay. control and then I can adjust that um, speed there. Yeah, I see where you have the ISO auto. So that's, that's what's yeah. That's itself. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Barbara, could, Phil here, could you ask, uh, answer on what kind of a camera that is and what lens it is? Oh, that's a Canon. Oh, gosh. Oh, right here it is right here. Um, it's an old camera. It's, it's uh, a Rebel. It's a Canon Rebel. And this um, is a uh, um, 75 to 300 millimeter zoom lens. And it's a uh, one, let's see, four to 5.6, whatever that means, I've forgotten, but. That's your is. aperture range. Okay. So one to six or something. Thank you. I was gonna ask yeah. if you're familiar with John Lucas on woodcentral.com. I know him, yes, yes. He's Why? a professional photographer and does uh, lots of great woodworking right. turnings, et cetera. So he's an interesting person. He's from my home state. I know him well. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. <laughs> One question. Uh, yeah. Barbara, where did you get the uh, gradient background? I got it online and I just Googled gradient background and I think it cost 30 to $40. And I don't remember exactly where it came from. I don't know if it was Amazon or just a camera place. Thanks. Yeah. And that's a, a, a situation where I can, I have it, I can take that off and then that's a door <laughs> to my shop. That's a like a barn door over there. Uh, so I can only put up my studio when I need to take photographs. I don't have to clean up that much, as you can tell. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. This is Walt Bennett. A comment. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, my my wife made me upgrade our camera outfit, and uh, so I've I've now got a Nikon uh, D thirty five hundred. But uh, what you've been saying is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, my issue is more with uh, taking pictures of her hats. Drives me nuts, <laughs> but anyway, for uh, for yeah. woodworking <laughs> things, it's great. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Walt. Thank you. I'm glad I remembered enough to talk about it because now it's just what I do, and I had to remember all that other stuff. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right. I don't know how I'm going to stand in for Bruce, but I'm, I'm going to try. Bruce put together this presentation, what, I guess several weeks ago, and asked me to, to talk about it. And as you can see, Bruce uh, 
Bruce went for the high-end uh, photography box there. And it works out really well when you see what he's done with it. Uh, the small objects, he used the box with the light show and uh, he has a tissue box as a support. And for larger uh, works, he, uh, he just puts a different support in there. And then if you go to the next three slides, he, he says they're pretty self-explanatory. He talks about some uh, where you can get the backgrounds. And the question came up earlier from Barbara, where you can get them. B&H has them, eBay has them. You'll find many different things that you can get the, the gradient backgrounds, lots of places out there. I have one somewhere and I think I used it once and never used it again. That's, that's my personal thing, but, and uh, let's go to the next slide. And for lighting, uh, the, the floodlights, uh, they're pretty self-explanatory there. He's used the floodlights and you could, one of the interesting things, I have a floodlight setup from years ago and, and now I'm talking about mine. I seldom use them anymore, but you can look there and they last about 20 hours. So I almost never do it. And but Bruce says, you know, usually takes at least one and sometimes from different distances. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And he's using his iPhone 6 at 1.3 megapixel. He, he says, I, I have a tripod. He hadn't used it in years. And I'm going to add an aside just for the fun of it. I have a couple of Nikons that I used to use all the time. And somebody asked me to take some pictures for a professional thing recently. So I pulled it out. But what's happened, the phone has just become amazing. I, I, my phone died New Year's. And I went out and bought a new uh, Motorola phone for $149 and it has 48 megapixels with three different lenses on it, all built in and it's magic. So <laughs> my Nikon sits in its case most of the time. But anyway, Bruce is using his iPhone 6 at 1.3 megapixels. And next slide. Uh, and the editing software he uses, uh, he'll talk about, he uses Photoscape. And it's a free software package. And you can crop, rotate, you can do just a myriad of things with this software. Uh, I'd never used it until Bruce mentioned it. And I went out and looked at it. He uses it on the iPhone. It works just fine on Android phones. Uh, I have the real Photoshop and I seldom get to it because I use Photoshop elements and can make more adjustments than I can imagine. Uh, now, one of the things with the free software, you do have to watch out for some of the adware. Uh, and you can get rid of that uh, with various mechanisms. But anyway, next slide. And here, uh, two or three slides of Bruce's pens that are just phenomenal. And he takes you through uh, some of the editing processes that he uses with these. Uh, and I think there are three different slides of this pen. Is that right? And, and let me see. Uh, and you can resize and do editing on that. And you can add text to the, to the slides if you like. But let's go to the next slide, because I think he shows some of the, the light gradients that he used. <clears throat> so these are pretty self-explanatory. The white background with a floodlight, white background with a camera flash. This is all the same piece. Blue background with a floodlight, blue background with a camera flash. And you can look and see which one you really like and how do you like it. Uh, but the same piece can be made to look very different depending on how you, you light it. And let's go to the next slide. And here is using auto correction in Photoscape. And I find it amazing the, the, the editing software that I use. Sometimes I like what it does on an auto basis. And most of the time I go back in and do a little touch up the way I like to change the lighting on there. But again, this is all free software and you can take the same picture and change it just drastically with the, the editing software. 
And next slide. And here are some of Bruce's pens and he shows a, a plexiglass holder and then holders that have a, a pins in the bottom that you can use to hold the, the, the pens up. And again, with the varying backgrounds. And the next slide. And I'm not sure I, I, I understood this. The music keeps the objects, uh, keeps around objects from rolling. I'm not sure I completely understand. I do understand the penny supports keep you from staining the backgrounds by putting pennies down so you don't really no, have no, to. No, 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 no. The, the wax from Oh, rolls, you, put, you put a dab of wax down. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. That's, that's one. This one, if um, fish a uh, new fish, um, fish finishing. A new finishing. Yes, it doesn't um, stain. Uh, the um, stain cracks. Yeah, so the the new finishing helps so the stain doesn't crack. Not in the cast. Doesn't doesn't um, make the um, this. It, oh, it doesn't make polish stain no, the, background. Yes. Okay. Because it affects you know, it affects the background. Doesn't 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 um, it doesn't stick oh, to the background. Yeah. No, 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 no. The, the, if if a new if, if a new finish um, stain background, that, yeah. So is it ru ruin it? So it doesn't ruin it. Okay. If you have a new stain on your on your piece, putting museum wax between it and the background will keep it from ruining the background. Not the. Wax. The penny supports. The, the pennies. The penny supports. Yeah, that's for the um and the uh finishing. Oh, yeah, uh, all. Oh. For all of it. All, oh, oh, all, oh. all. Oh, what? All, oh, all. Oh. Oil. So, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. One of these days, I'll be back. One of these days, that will be back in home. <laughs> yeah. You're doing great, Bruce. Yay, Bruce. Come on, buddy. Hang in there. Super race. We're thank you. All right. All right. So let's see. The Hokey Bandit. Okay. You know, I was uh, early on in the COVID outbreak, I was going to the bank for the club. It was raining. So I had my hood on and my mask on. And I thought, man, it's uh, really unusual being able to walk in the bank like this. So I, I had to take a picture of myself to, uh, to remember it by. <laughs> uh, I use a, an Olympus Pen F camera on a tripod. And the lens I use is of uh, 14 to 42 millimeter. Um, I bought a collapsible light tent on Amazon. I had included a link to that for anyone who might be interested, but it, it cost about $45. And it came with a number of colored backgrounds. Um, I usually use black, gray, or white. And I just have a bunch, you know, three desk lights that I put outdoor LED bulbs in that I use as my lighting. Uh, I generally shoot on a tripod. And like Barbara, I try to use a higher, you know, uh, aperture setting to keep the piece more in focus. I generally just uh, set it in the aperture priority mode. And I uh, let the camera select the um, ISO and the uh, shutter speed. Um, 
like Bruce, when you're taking pins, sometimes you um, have to, if you want to keep the clip on top of the pin or whatever, the pin will roll. Uh, what I use is I, I take a rubber band and cut it up into like little eight, one eighth inch sections and just sort of prop that behind the pin so the pin doesn't roll. So it'll keep it in the angle that you want to shoot at. His penny tip's a good one. I, I've stained a number of backgrounds, so that's something I need to start doing. And that's really all I have to add. Okay, next slide. Uh, before I talk about the photography, the piece is uh, another lost wood piece I made, uh, finished it after a time for submitting it. Uh, I wanted to get a tight grain match on it, so I actually made an insert ring for the joint rather than making the joint on the two pieces. Um, I guess my advice is to uh, shoot with indirect light to avoid shadows or at least minimize the shadows. Natural light on a cloudy day is great. Uh, if you shoot in sunlight or with a bright light, you get pronounced, pronounced shadows and glare. Um, now, I guess I kind of come from the get her done side of the uh, photograph spectrum. I don't generally uh, try to take a picture for hanging on the wall or uh, submitting to a museum or whatever. So. I don't really need a high quality photograph. Most of my photographs are for offering to the newspaper, a newsletter for show and tell or challenges. Um, so my setup there on the right is just a large piece of cardstock. You can buy a package of five of sheets of this stuff at uh, your local office supply store for about five bucks and save one for your backdrop and cut up the others for uh, patterns and whatnot. Uh, I've got a clip to a board that's laying on top of other stuff on my desk and propped up in the back so it's more or less flat. Um, and I found that the iPhone really, without much help, does a much better job of taking pictures than any of my array of point and shoot and upscale point and shoot digital cameras. Uh, uh, you can use uh, the photo app that comes with Windows 10 for adjusting brightness, uh, cropping, uh, resizing the photograph for putting in the newsletter or emailing. Uh, it's basic, but it's fairly versatile and does most of the things you want to do for just an average photograph. Okay, next slide. And this is a setup I don't use much anymore, but I included it uh, just as an option. An old uh, flannel pillow uh, pillowcase uh, doesn't reflect. Uh, doesn't detract uh, much from your piece, gives you a little bit of a shaded background. Um, especially what you wanna do if you're using either a, a digital camera or your phone or your photograph is uh, back off from it a ways and then zoom in. Uh, that lo like you're taking a, a portrait, it uh, reduces it, well, eliminates the fisheye effect and you get a more realistic uh, photograph of the piece. Um, so that's about it. Any questions anybody has? I'm happy to talk about it. Is your phone on a tripod, Chuck? Um, I have a tripod, but uh, it's easier just to uh, hold it and get the angle you want on the piece for best effect. You can move around a lot easier and uh, the uh, speed of the, the camera is such that you almost never get a fuzzy photograph. Okay, good. Must have a good steady hand. 
Uh, uh, but why, this wall, why didn't you get rid of the creases? <laughs> um, I just didn't bother ironing it. With, with some of these camera, these phones that have 48 megapixels and things like that, I found sometimes the, the picture size is too big. Um, how do you show, how do you make those smaller? Like if it's a six megapixel cam uh, picture, how do you, how do you shrink it? Um, if you've got Windows 10, just uh, click on it to open it and it'll pop open. And then there's a resize option. You may have to go through a few buttons to click, but there's a resize and you can make it, uh, it gives you like three or four different options. This one is about uh, 350 kilobytes. Oh, okay. I, I've had to do that with, I was just amazed at the size that my camera, take, uh, my phone takes now. I mean, it's just outrageous to try to send it to someone. But I take it in Photoshop Elements and very quickly resize it, and you know it brings it down to I can pick from low to high def. But by the time I'm sitting there with a, a six or eight megapixel picture that mm -hmm. popped off that phone, it's just scary, and <clears throat> I have to bring it down to a reasonable size. Well, usually now, if you're uh, emailing direct from your phone, at least the iPhone gives you an option to resize it before it sends it. Yeah, I, I never email directly from my phone just because I, I, I used to worry about the, the, the amount of stuff I was sending through my phone. Uh, and I just got in the habit of not doing it, even though it doesn't cost me anymore. And this is the issue with using your phone to take pictures. Uh, the issue is that if you use your phone, you have to transmit or either hook it up to your computer to put those pictures on to that instead of using data, uh, your data link anyway. Uh, the, the problem is if you wish to have a high resolution photo of something that could be like gallery uh, usable, you cannot just downsize it on your phone and then ship it off to someplace else. Yeah. You gotta get it to someplace where you can then manipulate it to make it gallery ready. Yeah, the, my method is not for galleries. This is just to be able to take a quick photo and send it somewhere via email. So uh, don't mean to detract or compete with what's gone on before. Uh, this is not gallery stuff. Yeah, my, my, my phone, I, I never send directly from it but I'm always backed up by Google and I grab my pictures off of Google and they're sitting there at six or eight megapixels in, in full strength all the time stored out there for free. Uh, and I've never sold anything. The only reason I ever take pictures of my work is so I can remember what I've done because somebody said, hey, you remember you gave me such and such and I forgot what the heck it was so I can go back and look what it was. <laughs> To go back to, I think, Steve's question about resizing, usually the menus, there's a menu, uh, most softwares will have resize within, usually within the first layer of menus. But if it, the, uh, you'll need to go to either edit or um, image is usually the menu header. Then, then within that there, you can usually find an image or resize uh, option within that menu. But it to depends on the software. That, uh, yeah, to, to add to that, Jared, one of the terms they use, the words they use is compress versus resize on some of the softwares. So if you don't size, find resize, compression is, or compress is another term they use. Right. And I had to do that all the time. Yeah. And the other thing to think about as you're resizing it, as you're, as you're, the, the the whole topic is what do you you know what are you trying to do with your photo? Um, are you trying to send it to a museum? Or are you just trying to remember it? If you're not going to find yourself printing pictures, then you don't need to keep a super high resolution image of it. But if you do want to be able to say, okay, this this looks this turned out really good, or I'm trying to trying to 
pr make uh, produce something that I may want to edit to put into a, 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 a magazine or send it into to, to um, Wood Turner's magazine. Um, then you you want to capture as much of that information as possible that's available to it. So you want to save the raw file or the uncompressed file, and then transport put that on your computer so you can edit. And then you have all the information you could possibly have about that image available to you in your editing software. So it really may just I, depends on what you're trying to do. May I add something to that? Uh, if you are posting for an article in a journal, or uh, well, I know the journals, they want the raw image. They don't want any editing, which is why you know I've got a setup that I can trust and I can adjust everything I need, the exposure and the focus. And when I do that well, I have that image and it's five or six megapixels and that's what's required. So they say they don't want any editing. They don't want you to resize it. They don't want you to adjust anything. They just want that raw image. So. Walt, I, Walt, I see you moving, but I'm not hearing you. Walt, I think you're still muted, buddy. Hit the space. Push and hold the space bar. Yeah, I've got nothing to say. I was just, I must have just been moving around. Oh, okay. Barbara. Uh, when yes. you say when you say raw data, uh, raw image, uh, when I send a photo from my cell phone uh, and uh, I want people to see detail, I'll send the large format uh, if, if it's just uh, you know, for information or just a piece of junk, I'll send the very small one. Uh, is the raw data the large format in a, in a cell phone? I don't know because I don't use my cell phone to take the kind of pictures I would submit to a show or to a journal. When I say raw data, what, raw? I mean that what that uh, camera captures with the exposure, the cropping and everything shouldn't be tampered with at all. That's what you need to send out if you're writing for an article or a show. Can yes. you hear me now? There you are. Ah, yeah. what, what everyone's talking about is RAW, RAW. That is a format for a photograph that is not a PDF or a, a, a JPEG or anything like that. It's the RAW image comes off of the uh, uh, the sensor in a digital camera, it's like uh, right from the film in an old thirty-five millimeter. All right, this is the one. It is not supposed to be altered. It is supposed to be the way it is. You cannot get this from a phone. All right, it right. must be from a camera. I have uh, I, I've been doing point and shoot cameras for years. The last one is Nikon A1000. That would even do raw, but it didn't do it right. For my wife's photographs of her hats, that's why I had to upgrade to a camera that would. What Barbara's talking about is exactly correct. You must give a, a gallery or a newspaper or anyone else a dot raw, R-A-W, photograph for them to even Think about publishing it. Thank you. The new iPhone um, 12 does shoot raw. It's a newer upgrade from Apple, but it will actually uh, it will actually shoot raw. There are some issues with it when you go to use it. So um, camera raws are far safer to use but it certainly is a move by the iPhone into the direction of, um, of raw photography. And uh, when you go to edit with any software, you wanna use non-destructive software so that your raw image is not actually converted to a JPEG in the process. So you wanna check and make sure any software is non-destructive 
because a lot of times in the past, software and some of the free software uh, can be destructive. And when you edit it, you lose that original picture. Lightroom, Photoshop, these are non-destructive. But uh, and that so you can lose a great picture by tweaking it a little bit and then not being able to go back. I don't know much, but I've been burned with all of those things and learned by bad experiences. So I offer that up. All right. Are we ready to move on? I think so. Well, here, here I am. You probably know the least of all that discussion. I'm, I'm not a photographer. And in fact, the old, uh, I never had a single reflex camera, self reflex, reflex camera that, that shows all the bells and whistles. But I got um, into the newsletter without having any photography information or experience at all. So what I, what I did is I did have a cell phone that took photographs. But, but most of my experience with the photographs were other people's photographs that were to be put in the newsletter. And it just so happens that I had an old copy that that I used of Microsoft Office that included a JPG editor. And I've got the, this was Office uh, 2010. It wasn't all that old, but it didn't suffice to do anything with the newsletters. So I had an upgraded Office suite, but I still kept that Office editor. And that's what I used. And the next slide, please. Oh, and we, before we go on, let me take a look at that photograph. I'm not big on making all the bells and whistles of making a photograph look cute with or pretty and, and great with a perfect background and all that. I, I took this picture, I just put it on the kitchen counter and snapped it on my, my cell phone. That's it. I don't need to go into a great deal of whys and wherefores. I have no idea what an f-stop is. <laughs> and I don't think I'll ever care to learn. But there's the photograph that I took. Take another, another slide, please. And so what I discussed with this, this newsletter editor, the, uh, the, the JPG editor, is these are the things that I use the most. The color adjustment. I would get photographs with terrible background, and 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 sometimes they were very so dark you you couldn't you couldn't see in the damn picture. So the color adjustment was very important, and I used it extensively to change the shading of the background and the shading of the the image itself. The next thing that I did almost every time was to crop the picture so it took some of the background out. Another thing that was used is when I got the photograph, I almost always had to rotate it to the right position to put it upright. I can't believe how many times I did that. And then, then there's the brightness and contrast that I have to do. But the, let me go back to that rotate and flip. Although the rotate is you can do it by degree. And oftentimes I got a photograph of an object that had a, a real tall finial. Well, if, that's, if that finial is not upright, it looks terrible. So rotating it right or left a couple of degrees and then crop the edges, it worked perfect. So that's another thing that your editor really needs. And of course, the resize and compress, you talked about that a few minutes ago. That's really a, a godsend when you're having a, these huge pictures coming in. The next slide, please. So they're talking about a background. Here, this pot that I made that showed up in the newsletter a couple of months ago, it was taken in my shop with a bright sunlight coming through the window. 
and I and I had that. I didn't put it purposely put it there. It was just there, and I looked at it with the sunlight coming on. I said, "Damn, I don't have to do another thing. I just take the photograph, and there it is." Once you once you crop it a little bit, take the next flip, and there it is, cropped. The background, because of that bright sunlight, has almost faded away. You don't even have to do a thing to it. And that's what I did. That's as raw as it gets. And take take another another picture. Is that is that same one again? I didn't I didn't realize I'm saying, saying talking about it again. But that's 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 that background, and I loved it. It's, and there was another photograph in the show and tell that had almost identical background to it. It was mar it was a little bit more marble than this is, but it worked great. Okay, and, and the other the other thing I need to talk about, the other thing I need to talk about is I ran across this article in a uh, in a fellow's uh, website. His and, and the fellow that is this John Beaver who did a demo for AAW uh, a month or so ago is a professional photographer. And so the he wrote this article and, is, and it's available for you to look at, at that website. And the, what he's talking about is the camera features, all the things that you talked about. So if you're not familiar with what an F, ISO and an f-stop and the lenses. And he describes all those in great detail. You know, I read it, but you know, that means nothing to me. I'm not interested in it. So on the next step, if you don't want to be so technical, the things that you really need and that he supposes, you need a tripod, you need a backdrop, and you need some lights. And he describes the lighting in, in great detail as well. It makes your the object brighter. It makes the object more attractive. And you give shape to the object. Then you give depth to the photo. And he describes that at length, how all that lighting is done. So lastly, but not least in this write-up, is several of the, the setups that he, similar to the one that Barber showed and then Chuck showed. But he has several also that he shows and how they and how he uses the lighting to, to achieve what he wants. And I thought, you know, if the guy's a professional photographer, and he, and by the way, he also does photography for movies, which I think we should do this kind of a discussion again, just talking about so photography for demos using using motion cameras rather than still cameras. So if you have any questions, um, you have to ask those guys who did all the presentation before because they have the answers, not me. Well, okay. we got another couple too, I believe. So I'm sorry. We have a couple more coming also. So okay. How about it? Hello, um, I've, I've been a photography geek all my life and uh, uh, this is the setup I use now. Uh, I've got a, a digital camera. I use a zoom lens, uh, telephoto, and I, just like Barbara talked about earlier, you can put the camera back farther and it, it kind of flattens the image a little bit. Um, I use a, a 50 to 230 millimeter zoom lens um, I got a collapsible uh, light box at uh, B and H, and I, I came with three backgrounds: a white, black. A white, black, and gray. And I kind of prefer the gray background. Uh, so that's what I use generally for most of my photography. Um, my light fixtures uh, are, I went down to Lowe's and bought some $6 clip-on uh, reflector type fixtures and I bought uh, some LED light bulbs. I got the biggest one they had, which was about 1600 lumens. Uh, and then I have that little desk lamp that I set out in front 
And I use that to provide a little extra light. If I have a, a say a footed vessel or something and I wanna get some light underneath it, I can throw some light under it with that. And it has a little bit uh, lower uh, brightness bulb. One thing is that that's critical when you uh, get your bulb, just make sure that they're all the same color temperature. You don't wanna have a 5,000 K bulb and then a 3,000 K bulb. You'll get two different uh, cast uh, of light color hitting the object. Um, okay, uh, next slide, Jared. In this picture, I, I wanted to show my setups before. Uh, early on, I just had a very similar to what some other people have, just a draped uh, piece of uh, background paper. Again, the gray. The first one on the left, my lighting was my shop lighting. Uh, so I had trouble getting light underneath. So I made these reflectors out of a uh, white foam core. So they would kind of reflect light underneath the object. And then uh, seeing Bruce's set up and uh, what you see on the right is a little bit more sophisticated version of what Bruce did. I went down to Lowe's and bought a, uh, uh, a shipping wardrobe box and I put it together, cut the end off of it and cut part of the top off, painted the inside white, uh, cut big squares out of the side and I went down to Joanne Fabric and, and bought the cheapest white taffeta material they had for like three bucks a yard and taped that to the sides and then using the same lights and my gray background, that was a system that I, I used for probably three years and it did pretty well. Um, uh, I wanna, on the next slide, I'll comment about why I'm using my hand uh, to hold the object. Let's go to the next slide. The software I use is Photoshop Elements. You can see this is the same photo where I've cropped all that stuff out of it. And, but the reason I use a hand, I, I sell a lot of things on Etsy. And uh, one of, usually I do six photos. I'll do uh, uh, four quadrant views of the side on view, but then I'll take a picture of the top and I take a picture of the bottom. When I do the top and bottom image, I hold it. And that way it gives the prospective purchaser a something to really get a sense of scale on the object. They can see a hand holding it and then they realize how big it is. You can give them dimensions, you can you know, put a ruler there. I used to, I had a little one inch cube I would set in the picture, but uh, I, I just, for these two images, the top and the bottom, I just sit there and hold it while I take the picture. And one thing I, I have with my setup, I've got a cable release. So I'm able to uh, fire the camera with the cable release and still reach the, the object and, and take the picture. Now, one thing, uh, as far as the adjustments you do in Photoshop, uh, the one that to me is very important is the image, the little box there to the right of the photo is called a histogram. And what that is, is a distribution of the tones throughout the picture left side is black, the right side is white. Um, what you want to do is have an image where uh, the tones are fairly uniform, almost like a curve, a bell curve. That's kind of the ideal situation. You can see on this histogram to the left, the, the curve goes right up against the left side. That's called clipping. And what happens is that's black, and there's nothing there. You've lost any, you can't recover any detail in that area. And it's probably the, the hole in the vessel is causing that. And if you look to the right, you see where the same thing is happening. And that's where the, the highlights are on the reflections. That's the white. And again, in that area, there's no detail. You, and you'll never be able to, to recover that detail when it's clipped like that. But um, Photoshop Elements is a, is a very good program. It's not that 
complicated. You can you can really do a, a nice job of of editing uh, your photos. Um, I always shoot uh, photos. I shoot both a raw picture and a JPEG at the same time. The camera stores both uh, formats simultaneously. But for most of my work, I just go in and edit the the JPEG image, and all I do is I usually uh, will adjust the exposure uh, in using the histogram, and then I'll adjust the contrast. I like the image to pop a little bit, so I'll I'll make the contrast and bump it up a little bit. Then I also go in and maybe adjust the saturation. And that just makes the colors. Uh, stand out a little bit more and uh, uh, then, then save it. And I, I usually for uh, uh, when I'm doing things for Etsy, I'll usually try and keep the image size around under uh, uh, um, uh, one megabyte uh, so that it'll transmit a little bit quicker. Um, and I think that's about all I had to say. Next. All right, and I'm going to switch over. Stan's got his presentation he's going to share directly. So I'm going to stop sharing so Stan can start sharing. All right, I, I think most everyone who talks so far, photography, except maybe Barbara, who really enjoys photography, but for most folks, it's just something that you do as an adjunct to your woodworking. But um, my, probably my first hobby was photography. I love it. I don't get to do a whole lot of it. So when I take pictures of woodworking or other things, I tend to spend a lot of time on it. Um, I've invested stuff over you know, decades. I probably have a lot more camera gear than most people do just because I've collected it. Um, and I just really enjoy it. Uh, but most of my stuff is old and it still works really well. I, you know, when I buy stuff, whether it's a woodworking tool or a camera, I try to buy something that, uh, it's going to last me for a long time. So uh, I'm just going to tell you how I do things, uh, but I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I really like uh, David's outline, so I'm going to follow it pretty closely up until the end where I, I have some tips for better photography. My backdrop is uh, seamless paper. Um, and I use flash for the light. I have a compact camera, not a point and shoot, but not a mirrorless or DSLR. It, it's kind of a high quality camera with a small sensor in it. I don't use a tripod most of the time and I shoot in raw. Um, so here you can see a, let me see what size that is. That's a 53 inch wide seamless paper background. That is thunder gray, but I also have white and black. Um, when I'm doing pictures for eBay or Etsy or something like that, I like to use a white background, but uh, the gray is really nice because you can get a, uh, a variety of tones. You can make it go almost black and you can hit it with a lot of light and make it almost white. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Here in the in the back of the uh, shop is a um, 107 inch black seamless paper that's attached to the ceiling and I can roll that down. Uh, it doesn't go all the way to the floor in this picture because there's a bunch of stuff that, <laughs> that I can't get it all the way down. I spent about two hours cleaning my shop just to take this picture for you folks. Um, then, um, Something I've been doing lately that I really like is using leather as, um, as the background. So far, I, that's a fairly small skin and it's a little hard to keep from seeing the edges of the background, but most skins have an interesting irregular edge. So if you do show the edge, I think that's interesting too. Over here uh, is an umbrella. Uh, this is a shoot through umbrella, but it also reflects light. Some of them have a black background to keep light from spilling out into the, to the rest of the studio, if we're going to call it that. And uh, just recently, I started 
attaching some stuff to the ceiling. This is in my basement shop. So I have exposed joists. Um, so you can see that umbrella is attached to an arm that's attached to the ceiling. So I don't have a bunch of uh, light stand legs to trip over. Uh, this is a small softbox. I have them. Um, this is my smallest one. I have them up to 40 inch, 48 inches in diameter. But this one's my favorite one. It's got a little handle on it. So I don't mount this one to uh, a light fixture. I just move this around. And by putting it real close, I would never use it in this position. It's just laying there. But uh, if you get close, you can get a real soft light, soft shadows. Um, but if you move it farther away, then the light is more directional, more like what uh, Barbara Dill showed. Uh, and then you can get a little stronger shadows. Uh, here's a, a flash just sitting on its head in the back there. Uh, one of the things I like about flash is you can put them anywhere. You don't have to deal with cords or um, light stands necessarily. But Sometimes I'll set one in the back just to put a little splash of light on the background. I might turn it toward the background to put a highlight on the background or the way it's pointing there would put a little bright line right on the back corner of that box to give it a little, little extra, um, make it look a little more three dimensionality to separate it from that black background. This is my camera. And on top of it is a remote flash trigger. So I don't have to run cords to my flashes. I just have that remote trigger. And then there's another one uh, on, on the flash that's in front of the umbrella. So they communicate wirelessly. And then the other lights are set to whenever they see the flash from the first light, they go off. So they don't all have to be wired. They don't have to have, they don't all have to have triggers. And what you don't see is a tripod. I, I usually don't use a tripod. I, I usually start out with one and then after about three pictures, I wanna move it and then the legs bump into something. So uh, I, I, do, I do not use a tripod usually. So why do I use seamless paper? Uh, I like to have a large background. I, I photograph large things sometime. And, it, and seamless paper is a lot cheaper than a muslin, a cloth. Um, it's easy to store. It you know, rolls up and fits in a box. It's about four inches square. It might be 10 feet long, but my shop ceiling is high enough. I can stand it up on its end. You don't have to worry about wrinkles and there's no seam. It looks professional because professional photographers, professional photographers have been using seamless paper for a long time. And we're used to seeing it in, in ads and portraits in a lot of places. And it lasts a long time too, when you care for it. You know, I didn't think paper was maybe a very good idea, but as long as you don't stand on it, if you're not taking full length portraits, uh, my stuff's all 20 years old. And I've, I've only had to cut off the end of one that I did stand on. Now, why the leather? I think leather really complements wood. I think they go really well together. Um, so it can add a little bit of a, a little bit of color. What I have in the picture there is black, but you know, leather comes in a lot of very natural colors and unnatural ones too, if you want to go that way. Uh, it smells nice. And you can make other stuff with it. That leather that I'm using, I didn't buy that photography. I built to make bags out of it. And uh, I'm just using it for a photographic background until I get to making the bags. Now, I, I'm a little bit surprised, you know, we've all who have talked tonight have a very different setups, but no one else is using flash. And, uh, and I do. Um, and I have a lot of reasons here, more button, more uh, bullets on this slide than any other. But a flash, because it puts all of its energy into very brief burst, is a lot brighter than any continuous light, LED or incandescent or halogen, anything else. And the real advantage there is you have, a, you can use a faster shutter speed. Just like Barbara said, you wanna use a small aperture, but with her lights, she's using like a one second 
uh, exposure. But with, this, with these flashes, you can have a shutter speed of 125th of a second or 200th of a second even higher if you have the lights close, like I usually do. Uh, so it's very easy to handhold the camera. You don't have to worry about that camera shaking when you're taking a picture. Another thing is the light of electronic flashes is very high quality. The quality of light is described by a color rendering index. Daylight is 100, incandescent lights are 100, halogen lights are 100, and everything else is below that, usually way below that. Fluorescent lights can be in the 60s. You know, those old green lights you have in the office, um, but they can, they can get better too. They can be up into the 70s or 80s. And LED lights, most of the cheap ones that you get at Home Depot or Lowe's, they're in the 70s or 80s. Uh, you can buy some that are specially made for photography and they get up to in, in the 90s. Um, and what that means, uh, LEDs and fluorescence, the light, well, the light from the fluorescent is actually ultraviolet and LEDs are blue and they put phosphor in front of the light emitting element to, to make it white. And they can't have enough phosphors to give you a really even distribution of light. There's always gonna be a dip. Most LEDs are strong in blue. You know, most of the colors are pretty even and then it has a peak in the blue. Um, most fluorescents, the peak is in the green because green phosphor is cheaper than the others. So at any rate, you don't have to worry about that with an electronic flash. And another thing that I know some folks have uh, alluded to is the room lights. With a flash, it puts out so much more light than all of my lights in the shop, and I have a lot of lights. They, those shop lights won't make a shadow, they won't make a reflection at all. So I can leave them on and I can see what I'm doing and, and not stumble around the rest of the shop. Uh, they're small and, and lightweight. You can move them around, put them anywhere you want to. And the really nice thing is, I mean, you can just, you can move them a quarter of an inch real easy. Whereas you know, a, a big light on a stand, um, it's a little hard to make those fine adjustments. And, and flashes have a wide range of power with an LED. Well, LEDs are usually dimmable, but a, uh, a fluorescent or a photo flood bulb the only way to dim the light is to put a, a gel in front of it or to move them farther away. If you try to dim a fluorescent or an incandescent, they change color. Now, on the compact camera, that's, that's not an inexpensive point and shoot. It has uh, the capability of external flash. I have manual focus. Uh, manual exposure, but it has a small sensor, smaller than what's in a DSLR, smaller than what's in a mirrorless camera. So it gives you a greater depth of field. I don't have to use F16 to get a good depth of field with this camera. I can go with F8 or maybe even F6 for those who you know about F-stops. Uh, so it just gives you a little bit more flexibility. But it has a higher, well, cell, cell phones have a tiny little sensor. Even if, even if it has 48 megapixels, the smaller the individual pixels are, the more noise you get in, in a picture. So that's the problem that most cell phones have. If you try to really use those 48 megapixels, you end up, if you, if you blow it up and really look at it, you end up with noise. Uh, but, uh, you know, my camera is nine years old. I have traveled all over with it. I've used it to take videos and, and pictures, portraits. I take it traveling with me. And uh, you can't buy that particular model anymore, but uh, new, you can buy them used for about 150, 200 bucks on, on eBay. Um, and it's, I just love the little camera. I already said I don't use a tripod. And I pretty much already said why, but one thing about using a tripod is if you want to take several pictures from the exact same angle, you know, you, you have three items that you want to take a picture of and you want to have your lighting set up 
to have a shadows in a certain place or a highlight in a certain place. That's a little hard to do without a tripod. So sometimes I pull out a tripod uh, when I'm taking multiple pictures of, of something that I want them to be consistent. And I'm kind of that kind of a guy. I want stuff to be consistent. Now I will shoot in raw format and someone already explained what raw format is, but the, the big deal, two big deals, it's not compressed and it has a wider dynamic range. Whenever you take a picture with, and your camera is set to JPEG, it compresses it. And it's a lossy compression. It's really throwing away data. And it decides when it does that conversion, how, what it wants to do with shadows and what it wants to do with, with highlights. And usually what it does is throw that stuff away because skin tones are midtones. And most cameras are built primarily to take good pictures of people. That, Cause that's what 95% of pictures are in the mass market is pictures of people. Selfies now, it seems like. But the raw format will keeps a lot more information in the shadows. So you can get deep detailed shadows in your final picture. And you also have good information details in the highlights they don't they don't get blown out to white now you can't really view a raw image my macbook pro if i want to pull up a raw image it takes about five seconds to decode it and show it to me and that's you know that's a pain so you you pretty much have to post process it a lot of cameras let you do what somebody mentioned you do raw plus jpeg i think that was dave um, and that's nice. You have that JPEG. They're small files, and you can send them off. You can view them instantly, but then you still have all the raw data to work with. I think every, everyone here used a different editing program. My favorite is Adobe Lightroom. Lightroom is, was designed from the ground up to be for photographs. It's not, you know, Photoshop is graphics editing plus photographs. And other things are, uh, you know, for making flyers and you know, all kinds of things. But Lightroom is just about photo photography. And it has all of the capabilities that you have in a dark room, dodging and burning. And, um, you know, you, you can adjust highlights separate from shadows. You don't just adjust exposure. Um, and it cost me $99. Because I, I bought it before Adobe went to the uh, subscription model. Now it's $120 a year. And so if I was starting now, I might use something else. But I love Lightroom. And all edits in Lightroom are non-destructive. And you have a history of everything you do. So I can spend an hour on a picture if I want to, adjusting, de-adjusting, readjusting. And then when I finally get it where I like it, I export it to a JPEG. And it remembers all my settings. So if I, if I go back later and I look at it and I thought, you know, what was I thinking? Why didn't I make this shadow a little bit lighter? I can go back to that step and change it. Uh, you know, I just, I, I really advocate Lightroom. And, and it always keeps your raw data. Um, you know, Jared was talking about, you know, once you put out your, you know, resize your picture and put it out, you don't really need all that, that data. But I like to go back and look at stuff years later and reprocess it. I don't do that a lot because it takes a lot of time, but um, sometimes I do. And, and all that image, all that stuff is there. It takes up a lot of disk space, but hard drives are cheap. And then as far as display, I didn't hear anyone answer this question, but uh, I, I love it on my iPad. I, all my favorite pictures are on my iPad. And at least once a week, I get those pictures out and I just look at them, whether it's pictures of family or stuff I've made or places I've been. It has really crisp colors. It's sharp. Um, so that's what I do. So that's my process. That's how I take tabletop pictures. But I want to give you some of my thoughts on how to take better photos, no matter what kind of camera you use, what kind of lighting, what kind of software you use. Uh, one thing I see a lot of people missing out on is setting the white balance. Um, 
back in the film days, you bought film for daylight or you bought film for tungsten lights. And, and it was balanced for that color and the color would always come out the way you'd expect it. Digital sensors, every sensor is different. Every camera, it seems, is different. Um, and we have a whole host of new lights now with fluorescence and bicolor LEDs and so on and so forth. But just about every digital camera, every one that I know of, I, I haven't seen this on a, a cell phone, but I hardly use a cell phone for white balance or for, for photography. But there, there'll be a setting where you push a button and then you hold up something that's ideally a neutral gray. And you can buy gray cards for that. Um, a Kodak gray card is about $45, but you can buy stuff that's nearly equivalent on eBay or Amazon for eight or $10. Anyway, you just you just push the button for white balance. You hold the card in front of your camera under the lighting that you're going to use and take a picture of it. You, well, you push the shutter button and it sets the white balance in the camera. So as long as you keep taking pictures with those lights, uh, anything that's white will be right, uh, white. Everything that's gray will be gray. It won't be yellow tinted or blue tinted. And I've seen a lot of pictures tonight with that yellow tint. So anyway, it's just a real easy step to take care of that. Now, if you want to go a step further, you can use a thing like what is here on the right. It's called a color checker. This is a color checker passport. It's uh, about four by five or three by, probably about three by five. They make bigger ones, but this one folds up in a plastic case so you can take it with you without getting it damaged. Those little color pieces aren't printed. Those are actual um, color chips that are made to a very high standard and an accurate color, a known accurate color. So you take a picture of that and in Adobe Lightroom and you can do it in Adobe Photoshop and probably Photoshop elements, I'm not sure what all, but there's a way to take that picture and it knows that that yellow is supposed to be a very specific color. And it'll look at your picture and say that yellow is not right. So it, it adjusts it. It'll ad you know, it'll, it'll make it a little bit less yellow, let's say. My, my camera, that Lumix LX7, the reds are oversaturated. They don't look real. And the yellow is just a little bit oversaturated. And some of the other colors are just a little bit off. And you can adjust that with the little sliders in the, in the software, but it's tedious to do that 100 times. So you, you create a profile in the software, and then you just apply that profile to every picture that you... Uh, import and it'll fix those colors for you instantly and that's well worth the uh, $99 or so that this cost. Um, if you have an inexpensive camera the color is not going to be very accurate. If you use LEDs or fluorescent lights the colors aren't going to be accurate. They're usually biased to one color or the other and they might look pretty pleasing but if you're going to have this um, you know, you want to print out something or you want something to look really nice, or if you're going to have it published, then, uh, then using a color profile really helps. I, my, I, my photography studio is in my basement, which is pretty dusty. And uh, so I have to remind myself to right before I take the photograph to clean the dust off of everything, clean it off of my uh, turning or clean it off of my background. There'll be little flakes of dust on there. And also look for streaks on your background. Uh, Bruce you know, mentioned that getting stain on a background. Uh, you, you, know, you lay something down as a, as a prop or something, or you might get stain on there. So it's good to look for that. So you don't have to you know, get rid of it after the, uh, after the fact in the editing suite. And keep your lenses clean. And I'm, I'm going to call out some, well, most cell phone users. You have that tiny little lens, and it's recessed, and it's right where your hand goes when you're talking on the phone. I've seen so many pictures, and especially videos on YouTube, they're done with a cell phone, and they're all blurry. You've got 48 megapixels in a $1,000 cell phone camera, but the pictures are terrible because that lens gets dirty. So that, that's something to keep in mind. And then when it comes to the, the actual photography, 
a good place to start is to set your lights at about 45 degrees. Now that's kind of the way it is in my, uh, my setup shot. And that's the way Barbara has her set up. It's not exactly 45, but it's, it's off to the side a little ways. Um, I've seen most people that use those light box cubes. And this is the way the advertisers advertise them. But they, they put the light right at uh, either side, even with your object. And it doesn't give a very pleasing um, shadows to the form. I'd suggest you move your lights closer to the front of the light box if you're going to use one. But that's not a rule. You know, don't do that for everything. That's just kind of a place to start. And then you decide you want to enhance a shadow someplace. You move your light around, move it up, move it down. And uh, I'm a big advocate of using manual exposure. If you're taking a picture of something light on a dark background and you point your camera with your, your white, your holly bowl, you put that right in the middle and the camera sets the exposure, it's going to try, try to make that bowl darker than it is in real life. It tries, the cameras are designed with the automatic exposure to make everything a mid gray. And so if you point it at a black background, it's going to want to make lighten that to go gray. And it's really frustrating if you're taking a picture of something and you say, okay, I've got, I've got this frame the way I want it. And then you say, well, let's clean, get a little more background in it. Then the exposure changes and you've got to mess with that in the photo editing software. So you've got um, a preview on the back of the camera. So I just set up my lights, start, take some pictures. I take, I guess at what the exposure should be. Look at the, the back of the camera until I get it the way I want and lock it down. And then, unless, unless you move the lights, but you can move the camera anywhere you want to and the exposure will still be the same and it'll be right. And as everyone has already said, use a telephoto setting. So I won't, I won't belabor that. I'd also encourage folks to compose your shot intentionally. And we can see that Barbara Dale certainly did that. She, she knows what she wants to highlight in her photographs. And you know, she wants to show that form. She wants to see the shadows. Um, there are composition rules out there. There's the rule of thirds. You can place things on a diagonal. If you have three things, you can group them in a triangle. There's lots of things out there, but they're, they're really nice rules of thumb to start with. I just encourage, you know, we tend to automatically center things. I know every picture of me when I was growing up, I'm right in the middle of the picture. I'm a little, little boy, I'm in the middle of the picture and there's a whole bunch of trees in the background or whatever it may be. Um, but a, a picture that's centered is usually not as interesting as something that's a little bit off kilter for, for one reason or another. I like geometric things. So I like sometimes to center my thing in the picture, especially turnings are symmetrical anyway. So by putting the object exactly in the center, making sure that it's completely vertical, if there's any kind of horizontal element in it, you know, a, um, you know, a background seam or uh, a, a burn line on the turning or whatever, I make sure that's exactly horizontal, then it becomes almost a piece of geometry. And then play with shadows and, and highlights um, by putting a soft light on something, you make your thing look more soft and approachable. Uh, a hard light makes the shadows harder and by a soft light is a big light. Uh, a hard light is a small light, small or far away. Sunlight is a hard light, except on a cloudy day, then it's a soft light because it's big, because the clouds diffuse the light. And then play with where your highlights are. You might want to put a highlight on a piece of pewter inlay or on a small beaded rim um, or on a, on a foot even. And 
also there's high key and low key lighting that are a lot of fun to play with. High key lighting is bright and happy. You see a lot of fashion and catalog stuff is done with high key lights and there are very few shadows. Um, stuff, well, I'll show you that in a minute. Low key lighting is dark, it can be dark, moody, can be mysterious, and it's almost always shadowy. This is high key. The, I, I didn't have any high key wood photos. I'm, uh, I apologize for that. These are things that are going on eBay. But you see an almost absence of shadow. Um, usually when you're trying to sell something, people aren't looking for your artistic ability in presenting it. They want to see all the details. They want to see all sides. They don't want something in shadow. They want to see what's in that shadow. And, you know, mystery is a bad thing when you're spending money. <laughs> anyway, so, but high key light is also fun and, and airy. So it's, it's good for a lot of things, not just for selling, but I just, I kind of stay away from it. Uh, maybe I did too much of that when I was younger. And, uh, and so now I, I go more for the dramatic low key lighting. Now these were taken on that black leather. And I also had a black seamless background to hide the, the edges of the leather. And then I kept the light off of the, the, the background as much as I could too. Now here I can talk just a little bit about raw image. See that image in the upper left with the, the two holly bowls. We all know that holly is very light and that leather is very black. Um, I'm gonna go to the, my last slide. And this is, this is a different picture taken on this, the same thing, but I've, I've blown this up and you can see, even though that leather is black, I hope you can see it on Zoom. In the front, you can see the, the texture, the pebbly texture on the leather. But if you look at the highlights on the back inside of the bowl, you can still see the grain in that. It's not a white spot. Uh, and that's very hard to do in JPEG. You might be able to do one or the other. You can overexpose and get the, the blacks okay, or you can underexpose and get the whites, but to get both is very hard. But it takes work. You know, this, this low key lighting in general takes more work in order to, to bring out the details in the highlights and shadows. If you let the shadows just go black, um, then, well, that's, that's great for, for the moodiness, but you lose the detail. Um, in this picture, you notice, you can tell the light in this case is about 45 degrees from my right, no, my left. <laughs> um, but you can still see the outside of the bowl all the way over to the right. It's not completely in shadow. I wanted to keep being able to see that shape. So I put a little white piece of foam core there. Um, so anyway, I tried to go quick uh, because I know it's getting a little bit late and uh, I hope I didn't, I didn't ramble too much and go too fast, but it, if you have any thoughts or questions, uh, that's that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Stan. That so what what was interesting to me um, was there's just the, the overall the whole pre, the whole night was there's something for everybody to pick up on if you just want to pick up your camp your phone and shoot something. But I, I've I've delved I've delved into some photography. And I've picked up a whole lot in the in in your in between you and Barbara and and, and uh, David also. Um, there's just a lot of good information there. Um, there was one thought that I had early on. I wanted to see how it landed with everybody else. So kind of a question for the panelists uh, or kind of observation. Um, when we're dealing with uh, resizing and and um, and uh, the getting getting the information into the camera everybody's kind of hit on it at one point or another what you what you put into the the preparation 
really pays off in the the the, the back end work um, in in technology and in, in my environment the the concept is garbage in garbage out um, if you start with something that is challenging you're going to spend a lot more time trying to fix it but if if we you know whatever camera you end up using if you start with a clean lens, uh, you know, dust free environment, you know, take take the time to prepare your shot as much as you have the patience for, you know, whatever that threshold is, go and do as much as your patients will allow. And that makes it that much you're you're that much further along, and you have to do that much less work in the software side. Um, and, uh, and but then there is the software that can help is help you along as well. So I, just, I felt like there was a lot of really good information tonight. So thanks, I, I would like to say thanks to everybody who who participated and, and brought that out. Dan has a question. Have at it. I think I've seen that for $3, I can download an app that will give me manual control of my uh, camera on my cell phone. Is it worth three dollars? There are. I don't know which app that was, but there are some apps that are excellent for use on. They have an iPhone or a Android. I have an uh, iPhone. iPhone, of course. Okay. Yeah, that's. I have a Apple iPad, um, and I can give you my recommendation. I don't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, they make a really they really make a really big difference. At least at least the good ones. Now the one you're talking about, I don't know which which one that is. But the one I bought now the prices you know they go up and down all the time. But it was about fifteen dollars, um, and it was worth it to me for the what little I use the uh, the iPad to take pictures. Dan, what was the app you? I, I can't remember. I was looking. I, I don't know how I stumbled across it, but uh, you know, I, I hate uh, automatic cameras. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, photography was a hobby, uh, certainly before wood turning, and I never owned an automatic camera until uh, smartphones came out. And uh, you know, I just have this little desire to get back to back to photography a little bit. As far as apps go though, I would say, you know, I don't have a specific recommendation or would, would know, but I would spend, if it's something that you're curious about, I just spend a little bit of time on YouTube, just search the app and and see what, what uh, you could usually find somebody who will give a review of it and show you through, show you through some of the features. And I would just see if that is of interest to you. You know, if that, if what they, uh, if the features that it does seem to do what you want it to do and, and then decide if that gives you the value that you're, you're wanting out of it. Um, your camera is your camera. It's going to be, that's your phone is, that's the quality of the lensing that you're going to have. It's just a matter of does the app give you the, the control that you're looking for. And I think YouTube should be able to give you some good feedback on that or the reviews in the app store. Can I add one? fun little thing I, I found recently. I found a rotary table that somebody advertised and it's battery operated with lights, but you can plug it in to, and it rotates, I don't know, a, a revolution or so, but it's only $8.45 from Side Plus. And it's phenomenal. The, the things you can demonstrate on a pen or whatever. And I do mobiles every now and then for young kids, and I just thought that would be great to hang up and use on it. But at 845, it, I find them just phenomenal. Is that, I've, I've got one that didn't work out too well for me, and I don't know how much it cost because it was given to me, but the what's the, does it give a weight rating on how much it can hold? In other words, could it hold a small bowl? But, yeah, can you, you know, it's got a mirrored bottom and a bunch of LEDs in it, and if you don't want the LEDs, I guess you can block them out. But uh, with battery, it just shows the LEDs up under the object. Uh, but if you plug it in, it rotates and it rotates very slowly and it's pretty doggone neat for the little, I bought three of them 
just because they had a 750 minimum shipping charge. So it ended up about 11 bucks a piece with three of them. Oh, by the way, Dan, uh, the, the apps that I use, I have two of them. One is Camera M and the other one is Pro Camera. And I think it's Pro Camera is the one that gives you the full control. But the, the other one is a, is a pretty decent app too. Looks like ProCam 8 is in the App Store right now for $7.99. Is that good for the iPad? Yeah, any iDevice, iPhone, iPad. And look at the um, look at the re requirements. There may be like some, the one nice thing about iPhones is they last for a long time. One of the side effects is sometimes like the newer, cam newer phones have more features in the cameras that may not be like some of these apps may be built for the iPhone um, uh, 12 Pro, whatever, with the uh, multiple lenses, you know, look at the descriptions to make sure your, your, your device is, uh, is, is built for it. But just want to thank everybody for participating. It was a good discussion, I thought. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I like seeing what everyone else is doing, and I've I learned a few things too. So it's great. Me Thanks too. Thanks for putting it together. Yeah, always. Uh, this is great. Good to see how everybody does things. I learned a lot too. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.